I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you this morning as we commence our 2014 Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Pride Month observance here in our nation's capital at the Department of the Interior. I also extend that welcome out, to our, out on the landscape to all our Department of, of the Interior employees who are watching this program via our live stream. My name is John Shemrai. I am currently the Acting Chief of the Office of Diversity and Equal Opportunity at the U.S. Geological Survey. This morning I have the honor to serve as your Master of Ceremonies and facilitator for our program. The USGS is the lead bureau coordinating today's event, but certainly we had a lot of uh, help and other coordination through other offices, other bureaus of the, of the department, the Office of Civil Rights, and um, also from the DOI Globe chapter as well. And for those of you that do not know, DOI Globe is the Department of the Interior's gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender employee organization and resource group. <clears throat> and just for ease of our discussions today, I will use the acronym LGBT to mean lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. It's a lot easier on the tongue to say it that way instead of extending it out. And I think we're all used to acronyms here in the federal government as well. So, okay, before we uh, officially begin today's program, I need to take care of one housekeeping item and remind our webcast viewers about earning your annual diversity credit for viewing and participating in today's program. So if you'd like to earn diversity training credit for today's program, You'll need to send an email to Barbara Rogers of my staff, and her email address is B Rogers, that's B R O G E R S, at usgs.gov. Also, if you pre registered for today's event via, via DOI Learn, you'll still need to send Barbara an email. Um, once again, her, at, her email address is B R O G E R S, at usgs.gov. Thanks for that. Okay, our theme, theme for today's program is For Real, Positive Progress, Federal Progress. And I believe for myself that the progress certainly has been for real. When I think about uh, next Thursday, June 26th, will mark one year that Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act was ruled unconstitutional. And as a result of that decision, the U.S. Office of Personnel Management is now able to extend benefits to legally married same-sex spouses of federal employees and their annuitants. That is both federal progress and positive progress. Another for real instance and milestone is the use of the phrase diversity and inclusion. I believe most of us have gotten to accustomed to recognizing the value of diversity, but we need to ensure that all our employees are included in all our policies and programs and practices. And we also need to ensure that diversity and inclusion, uh, the diversity and inclusion principles are integrated into our work life and our daily operations. That's really a goal of the department and of all the bureaus. Of course, we've also included gender identity in, in the department's non-discrimination policy. Again, really stressing the concept of diversity and inclusion. So this morning we'll have the opportunity to hear different views from a variety of speakers on what is for real and what progress looks like, particularly for the LGBT community, the LGBT federal community. <clears throat> so to begin our program, I'd like to introduce and say a few words about our first speaker who will officially welcome you to the program, um, Ms. Mary F. Pletcher. Mary F. Pletcher is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Capital and Diversity. In this capacity, Ms. Ms. Pletcher provides leadership and executive oversight for the Interior's human capital programs, including human resources, civil rights, employee and organizational development, and occupational safety and health. Prior to this role, Ms. Pletcher served as the senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Policy, Management, and Budget, supporting the Assistant Secretary in the implementation of management initiatives and transformation efforts. Ms. Pletcher joined the Department of the Interior in April 2006, where she served as the Department's Capital Planning and Investment Control Program M Manager until February of 2009. Shortly after that, Ms. Pletcher served as the Deputy Recovery Act Coordinator for Interior. 
In this role, Ms. Pletcher supported the senior advisor to the Secretary for Economic Recovery in the implementation and oversight of Interior's $2.9 billion Recovery Act program, which composed of, of over 3,400 projects across eight bureaus and offices. <clears throat> From July of 2010 to November 2011, Ms. Pletcher served as the Acting Director and Deputy Director of the Interior Business Center, which provides a variety of administrative shared services to the Department of the Interior and other federal agencies. Ms. Pletcher received her Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Florida. She received her Juris Doctor with honors from the American University Washington College of Law. And Ms. Pletcher was also nominated and selected as a, as a 2011 Service to America Medal finalist. So please help me welcome Mary F. Pletcher. Good morning. All right, let's try that. That was a, that was a wimpy good morning. All right, good morning. I didn't know that my bio was going to get read, um, so it took me back a little bit. But I want to officially welcome you to the 2014 DOI Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Trans Transgender Pride Month observance. Um, as John indicated, I'll use the acronym LGBT um, going forward. As noted in the Presidential Proclamation, which I hope you all take a look at in the program, during this month, we celebrate victories that have affirmed freedom and fairness, and we recommit ourselves to completing the work that remains. I'm thrilled that the um, theme of the program and the month this year is for real. Um, there's been a lot of federal progress, but there's a lot of progress that remains to be done. I'd like to thank our special guests and panelists, uh, Matthew Murphy from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Sharon Wong from the Office of Personnel Management, Sarah McBride from the Center for American Progress, Rachel Muir from the US Geological Survey, Ike Kelly from Policy Management and Budget, and our Master of Ceremonies, John Shemrai. Excellent, good. The LGBT community is part of the landscape and diversity of our nation, as well as an integral part of the commitment to diversity and inclusion at DOI. Last week, I was excited to be present at the inaugural panel um, discussion of a new theme study that will explore ways to interpret the stories and history of LGBT Americans for inclusion in the parks and programs of the National Park Service. The National Park Service is tasked with telling the stories of all Americans and connecting Americans to our cultural heritage. And the theme study is part of a broader heritage initiative to ensure that the Park Service reflects and tells a more complete story of the people and events responsible for building this nation. After all, the study is a priority for DOI because place really matters. If you think about the moments in your life um, and the moments in history, there's the connection to the place um, and, it, and it binds us together. It's a lasting statement in its nature as it has a way to interface and connect so many different perspectives. So as just one example, this month, we mark 45 years since the patrons and communities surrounding the Stone, Stonewall Inn in Greenwich stood up to defy unjust policies. And that's the very first place that's been recognized within the National Park Service. Um, so it's very exciting to see this panel study underway um, in the, in over the next couple years as it unfolds. I think we'll see more landmarks included. Um, there's a, there's four, I think four or five places that have been included at this point, this, uh, at this point Stonewall Inn, and then I believe four others. Um, and they're all East Coast focused. Um, and so over the next few years, and with the work of this really uh, robust and impressive group of scholars, we'll be identifying more places. So today's program is an important opportunity for increasing awareness and understanding. You'll hear today about some of the future policies to be implemented within all federal government departments and agencies, and some that have already been in place and that are leading examples and best practices that were several years ahead of their time. It's worth noting that President Obama has appointed more than 300 openly LGBT professionals to serve in his administration. There are now more openly LGBT presidential appointees than all previous administrations combined. 
They include, and this is just one example, but one that has a connection to interior, John Barry, who is the ambassador to Australia. He was formerly the director of OPM, and he also used to be the assistant, assistant secretary of policy management and budget at DOI. The president has also appointed more than a dozen openly gay federal judges. Um, they include Elaine Kaplan, who's a judge at the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, and she's a former acting director and a general counsel of OPM. So thank you for attending today's program, whether you're here in the room or across the country. Let's continue to celebrate the great diversity of the American people, our DOI employees. And in the words of the president, let each of us speak for tolerance, justice, and dignity. Because if hearts and minds continue to change over time, laws will too. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate your welcome for us. All right, so first on the program, we're going to hear from, uh, from Matthew B. Murphy. And uh, Matthew is the founder and president of FedQ, which is a national employee resource group for LGBT employees and allies in, in the government. Matthew is also the director of the Office of Equal Opportunity at the Equal, Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC. There he, has over, he oversees the agency's internal complaint processing program and, and affirmative employment programs. Prior to becoming a civil servant, Matthew worked as an attorney in the private sector where he represented both employers and employees in employment discrimination cases. In both his personal and professional life, Matthew has acted as a vocal advocate for equality, working towards the goal of creating a workplace where individuals have the opportunity to be assessed on their merits. <clears throat> Mr. Murphy also serves on the board of directors of the Federal Employees with Disabilities Incorporated and is a frequent speaker at conferences on topics such as LGBT cultural competency, the Rehabilitation Act, the ADA Amendments Act, and best practices for avoiding EEO complaints. So please help me welcome Mr. Matthew B. Murphy. John, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you to Ms. Uh, Pletcher for being here. Thank you to my distinguished panelists. This is a huge honor to be here, and I was uh, somewhat shocked to, to be invited to be the, um, the keynote. So in connection with that, I also want to thank Amelie, who is a, uh, a, a huge asset to our community and a huge um, advocate for LGBT rights. So I want to start today by just talking about LGBT rights in the context of human rights. LGBT rights are human rights. Uh, we are not a Western construct. We are not uh, something unique to the United States. We've existed uh, cross-culturally and trans-historically. We've used different terms to identify ourselves, but we do have one thing in, in common. There has been uh, again, throughout history and across cultures, objection to our very existence. And much of the objection to our existence is related to, as evidenced by political and judicial discourse, the fact that our sexual relationships call into question the natural order of male dominance. And so many of us who've looked at this and studied this for many, many, many years have realized that discrimination against LGBTs is really a form of sex discrimination. The courts have slowly caught on to that and continue to ca catch on to that. So today, we're in a position where we know and we understand, and the courts understand, that gender identity discrimination is in fact sex discrimination under Title VII. We're working towards expanding that view uh, to encompass discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And for those of you who work in EEO offices or work for the federal government, you should be aware of the fact that, per the EEOC's guidance, if you contact your EEO office and allege discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, you should be given the right to file under 29 CFR 1614 
under Title VII because your claims could ultimately uh, be construed as sex discrimination under Title VII. So that's important. So in this context of LGBT rights as, as human rights, we note that around the world we have been discriminated against in employment, in housing, in our familial relationships, in our right to travel, in our rights to association. And that continues, and that continues today. But today, most of us, as people of good conscience, realize that uh, discrimination against all is, is not okay. It's not okay with respect to religion, with respect to sex, or with respect to uh, LGBTs. And the federal government, things are far, far, far from perfect. But we've come a long way from 1947 when President Truman issued an executive order declaring uh, essentially that we're unfit for employment in the federal government. We've made significant progress. A lot of that progress was mentioned by John. Much of it will be discussed later. But it is important to note. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, pride now. A lot of people ask, why, why do you celebrate pride? Are, are you really that proud? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not so proud to be straight. I don't run around you know, with a, a, you know, a flag saying I'm straight and I'm so proud. But, but what, is, what is pride? And I, you know, I looked up the definition, and pride is a feeling of honor and self-respect, a sense of personal worth. And so many of us, unfortunately, have grown up learning, being enculturated to feel shame. Shame as in we are doing something bad, we are doing something wrong, we are uh, not right for being who we are. And so in response to that, we decide we feel proud. In response to the shame, our legal, cultural, educational, social institutions have made us feel, we banded together. We're unified in this oppression, just like every other group. We don't necessarily, we didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm gay. Uh, hey, you're gay, let's form a group, let's bond, let's unite. No, it's actually a response, just like with every other group, it's a response to historical oppression. So we unite, so we could, have the same rights everybody else does. But that's why we have pride. And some people, you know, ask, and I even joke, you know, I've, I was asked to speak at a lot of events this month, this month for pride, and, and most of them I had to turn down because of, of other commitments. But I joke with my friends, I'm like, wow, this is, this is a lot, you know, it's really difficult to be proud for a whole month, you know? And, and I wish, is there, is there a store, is there somewhere where we could buy some of this pride because you know, it does, it does get a little exhausting, and, and I am proud, of course, but it does take a lot of energy to be that proud for one month. But people do wonder, why do we celebrate this? Why do we have this Pride Month? And it is an opportunity for us to feel okay with who we are. When I started practicing law, I was at a law firm that I, I went to. I had a, an offer to make uh, between double and triple the salary I accepted at this law firm. And I went to this law firm, because one of my mentors, who was a federal judge in, in the Sixth Circuit, uh, said to me, this is a great firm, excellent reputation, and they have two openly lesbian partners in this firm, which was very, very rare. In Cleveland, we had one partner uh, that was well known, who was open, he was a member of the HRC, and he was kind of looked at it, uh, by all of us as this anomaly, this hero, this mysterious figure. Uh, who was he and, and how did he did it? How did he do it? But this firm, two open lesbians. I was thrilled. I went there. I interviewed. Uh, this didn't come up at all. Um, but I loved it. They loved me. I started working there. Was doing great work. Work I really enjoyed. I was working with clients I really enjoyed. I was working with people I really enjoyed. And we had a, a, a welcoming dinner for me uh, and a few others who started. And so. We're at this dinner, some of the partners left early, and, and after a few drinks, a couple of the guys and a couple of the females decided to pull me aside and 
kind of warned me because they had noted that I had developed a close connection with Kieran and Kieran. And they wanted to make sure that I realized they were dykes. And I may not want to associate myself too much with them because people might start to think I'm a fag. And, and that probably wouldn't be good for my career, particularly since I wasn't married, didn't have a girlfriend, didn't want to be in a position you know, where I, I gave people to, to be suspect. Because I already had these reasons. I wasn't married, I didn't have a girlfriend, and didn't talk about dating. And then here I am with these two dykes. So, Quickly, you know, I, I realized that this, this was an environment that not, wasn't necessarily positive for LGBTs. And I continue to hear comments like this on, on a regular basis, not just directed to these two women, but to others. Uh, Karen and Karen were incredibly strong people, much, much stronger than I was at the point. Uh, and this really had an impact on me. And it was very difficult for me to go to a place to work where I realized I had to hide who I am. Um, on the weekends, I would have to worry. There were certain neighborhoods in the community where you had LGBT bars, uh, well, mostly gay bars. We sometimes self-segregate, uh, which was something I never fully understood. And, uh, but anyhow, we would, and so you'd go to these gay bars, and I would be very nervous walking out. I mean, I would you know, put a hat on, put some shades on, and, and I, I, I would be nervous because it would have been a very serious problem if some of the partners at my firm saw me coming out uh, of, of, of one of these bars. So that was sort of the circumstance that, you know, I was in, and at this point, I had already realized that there were other LGBTs, because when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I thought I was the only gay person in my community. I remember working at a pizza shop, this guy had made a comment once, and he said, oh, that guy was a fag. I'm like, yeah, you say that about everybody, whatever. And he's like, no, no, he, he was a real one. Like, he has sex with men. And I was so excited. I was like, no way. There can't be someone in my town in Ohio who is gay. And so I'm trying to think, like, how do I, how do I find this guy? Like, what kind of excuse do I use? And, you know, I'm relatively old. I was born in 1973. But, you know, we're not talking about 1900. Uh, but... Uh, you know, I, I, I found some excuse and I ran out there and I'm looking all over because I wanted to talk to this guy and see if he was real and of course he was already gone. But just knowing there was somebody else that made me so excited. And I went back and I kind of talked to the guy like, so are you serious? You really think like, you know, he's gay, isn't gay? Like he has relations with men? And I hoped every day that he'd come back in and I could find a way to sneak out and, and talk to him about it. Because, again, I thought I was the only one. So this is part of why we feel pride. Um, and it's important. And it's still important today. There are parts of the country where a lot of LGBTs just don't feel comfortable being out. Uh, it's true in D.C. Uh, we could still be fired in, I think, 23 states. Somebody could probably correct me if I'm wrong. But we are making progress. Uh, we have uh, an incredibly supportive president. Uh, we have an incredibly supportive team of people at OPM. Sharon Wong has been a tremendous leader in our community. Uh, there are others at OPM. Director Archuleta has been very supportive. We have Kai Feldblum at the EEOC who's been really pushing the envelope and really encouraging uh, a, a, an accurate uh, interpretation and reading of Title VII. And so we have made all kinds of progress. We are here today. And this is, this is not the first time. We've had people at agencies like Ike Kelly who've been dedicated for years and years and years to uh, creating a positive workplace for, for the LGBT community. So we have made a lot of progress. Yesterday, I spoke at the government printing office, and it was the first live LGBT celebration that they've ever had in their history. And so, we have a long way to go. We have things like a carrier letter, OPM just, uh, a letter OPM just issued to carriers saying uh, health insurance companies can cover uh, uh, transgender-related procedures. That was a big step. But even with that, we have a big way to go. We need something that says you are required to do this. But, you know, I'm one, and we're working towards that. We realize that's not, not the end point. But, we have made great progress, and we have an incredible, incredible group of people in the government. And, and we thank all of you. If we have allies in, in the room, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
because uh, it's not always easy to be an ally either. You face uh, risk, you face discrimination, uh, you face guilt by association, um, and, and for some people that's uncomfortable. You also face the reality that you don't always know what is the appropriate terminology. I'm an ally, I don't want to offend people though, and, and we as a community tell ourselves we have to be accepting of the fact that uh, a lot of our allies want to be allies, want to be educated, want the information, want the resources that they need uh, in order to be effective allies, and you're not perfect, and we're okay with that. So ask us questions, FedQ, we are a group, uh, a national LGBT organization, and we hope you uh, get involved. Uh, you can find us, we're at www.fedq.org. We have a conference coming up in September, and we have a lot of events coming up. We partner closely with OPM, the EEOC, and, and many other organizations. So I just want to close and say thank you again, thank you in particular, and everybody here, uh, and happy Pride. <laughs>Thank you, Matthew, for, uh, for that uh, reminder and speech to help us uh, how, we, how we celebrate Pride and why it's important to, to do that in many, for, for many of us. So, uh, and I think what I was thinking about when, when you were speaking, Matthew, was uh, just the impact that we have when we don't bring our whole selves to, to our workplace and our organization. So being, being proud of who you are is also a very important aspect for that, too. So thank you for that reminder. Okay, uh, we're going to begin our panel discussion, um, and Matthew's going to be part of the panel as well, so I don't know if folks were thinking about questions for Matthew. Uh, hopefully you jotted those down, but we'll get to the questions at the end. So what we'd like to do is, is hear from each of our, our panel members, and then we'll, we'll take questions. And I want to remind folks on the, on the webcast, too, I believe there is the ability to submit your questions as well, and we'll, uh, ho hopefully we'll get a chance to get all your questions answered. As, answered. <clears throat> Okay, our first panel uh, speaker is Sharon, is Sharon Wong. And Sharon Wong is the Deputy Director for Coordination and Policy in OPM's Office of Diversity and Inclusion. That office uh, is the office that leads and manages the government-wide diversity and inclusion effort. She came to OPM in September of 2011 after 11 years as the Diversity and Inclusion Officer at, at NASA Goddard. Her work experiences include 15 years as a lead software integration and test engineer at NASA. In her spare time, Ms. Wong serves as national president for the Organization of Chinese Americans, which is a national Asian Pacific American social justice and civil rights advocacy organization. She's also the past chair of the Asian American Government Executives Network, or AGEN, also an organization of federal uh, Asian Pacific American executives. She also has been the past president of FAPAC, or the Federal Asian Pacific American Council. Ms. Wong also served on the Maryland Commission for Women and was recently the diversity and inclusion co-chair for the Human Rights Campaign Board of Governors. She has a BS in physics and an MS in engineering systems analy analysis from the University of Central Florida and a diversity management certificate from Cornell University. So please help me welcome Ms. Sharon Wong. Good morning. Can you hear? Does that work? Yep. Okay, I, I didn't know he was gonna read the entire bio like that. <laughs> so uh, thank you, John. Sure. Um, just so good morning and thank you for inviting me to be part of the Interior's LGBT Pride Month uh, celebration. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always in awe when I'm on a panel because it, it's, it's, it's always such distinguished people and I always wonder why I'm on a panel when you really want to hear from everybody else, but I will try to do my, my best. Um, so you hear that I'm at OPM in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And that's actually a fairly new office. Uh, comparatively speaking, it is about uh, three years old. And it was stood up, you know, right after two that Executive Order 13583 came out um, about promoting a coordinated government-wide effort on diversity and inclusion. And one of the areas under my portfolio is LGBT issues. And so that actually gives me a very unique 
uh, perspective when I work with the agencies to create a more diverse and more inclusive um, workplace for everyone, including LGBT employees. So um, I'm going to share my perspectives today on LGBT inclusion, successes, and where we need to be. And I hope when you run out of here, you don't say, you know, OPM said, this is Sharon saying, I just happen to be at OPM, because that's a lot of times if, you know, I may uh, forget, I get comfortable, I start saying things, the next thing I know, OPM said something that I didn't know. <laughs> um, so really from my vantage point, we, we, we have made progress. You have heard us um, acknowledge the progress, but I really think so. We also have a lot of way to go. But I always like for us to acknowledge progress because sometimes um, people only see the glass, um, you know, that half full, half empty, and it's always, what haven't we done? I'd also like people to see what have we done. Um, again, just think about a year where we, uh, ago where we were. Uh, before the Supreme Court ruled on DOMA, you know, where we were with benefits. And just as a reminder, this afternoon, right next door, OPM at 1.30, we're going to be uh, conducting a webcast. It's also be um, in person on the overview of benefits for LGBT federal employees. So if you have time, please go over to that. Um, as a result, after this, I'm also speaking at the Baltimore FEB, so if I have to uh, run out the side a, a little bit early it's because I have to get up to Baltimore to, to speak also um, on an LGBT, uh, conduct an LGBT workshop. But given all of that, let's, let's talk about, first of all, why should LGBT inclusion matter? Hopefully you also know about two reports that came out within the past month. One from MSPB, which is Sexual Orientation and the Federal Workforce, and also HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, put out a, a report on the cost of the closet and the rewards of inclusion. We all know that having an inclusive workplace results in improved performance and productivity for all. And a lot of times people like to say, oh, we're an inclusive workplace. But I'll tell you what, if you have even one group of employees that, don't, that feel that they are excluded, or that they don't feel included, you can't claim to have an, include, um, an inclusive workforce. There's not an inclusion but, okay? There is no but after inclusion. And I may say that because I'm talking in the context of LGBT, but this applies for everyone. Um, employees having to hide their sexual orientation really comes at a cost of engagement and retention. You've heard, we, we bring our whole selves to work. And a lot of time when that phrase is used, bringing whole selves to work, people think it only applies to LGBT. But it applies to parents, okay? Especially parents that have kids. When you come in through the front door, if your kid was sick that day and you have to leave them at home with someone, you don't come in through your front door and say, I'm just a federal employee today or a DOI employee and Everything else is outside of this, okay? You are all day thinking about your child that, you, you know, you're calling home, is, is he or she okay? Have they taken their medicine? Are they sleeping well? Did they eat? It is the same thing for LGBT. We don't walk in through the door and suddenly that's all forgotten, all right? Those two surveys I mentioned, one of them talk about, and then this is not just for federal employees in general, 53% of LGBT employees hide who they are at work, okay? That's slightly over half of all employees, uh, LGBT employees hide who they are, okay? 35% of LGBT employees feel compelled to lie about their personal lives at work. So one third of, of, of LGBT employees hide, who, um, lie about who they are. Also, employees should not have to leave a job because they're made to feel unwelcome. And part, one of those report surveys showed close to 10% of LGBT people report leaving a job specifically because they were made to feel this way. And so no employee should, an employer should lose talent and employee engagement used to problems, uh, due to problems that I consider are treatable. Okay, so given that, what, full, what should full inclusion look like? Okay, and these are some of the things that I work on in my job. We need to make sure it, it's full inclusion when you have inclusive and transparent policies, programs, and procedures. 
For example, when sexual orientation and gender identity are part of non-harassment and non-discrimination policies, you'd be surprised that they are still agencies where these dimensions are not included in their non-discrimination and non-harassment policy, okay? Also, Matt talked about um, avenues of redress for claims of discrimination. There's a lot of employees, there's even agencies that don't even know what their avenues um, of redress are. And I know that because I'll give you an example. Uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I was polling agencies on their avenues of redress. Did they know that they were used in the EEO process? And I will tell you that one, one agency came back and, you know, in their email, and they actually put the word not and underlined that we do not have a process in place. So I actually picked up the phone and I called over there and I said, um, first of all, I have to tell you that you're the only agency that told me no. Um, so she said, I'll tell you what, let me look into this. And throughout the day, she would, every time she found an answer or she spoke to someone, she'd email me. I spoke to so-and-so and they said this. And by the end of the day, she says, you know what, we know we can use the EEO process, which and they didn't know. And she says, and we're also going to make sure we document that and let employees know. I mean, that's the kind of thing when I say people don't, I mean, employees don't even know. Even the offices that should know, don't know. Um, another thing about what full inclusion should look like. We talk about employee groups. So LGBT employees group should be allowed to organize, exist, and be supported like any other ERGs. The same thing applies for SEPM, Special Emphasis Program Managers. They should be appointed and supported just like other SEPMs because I will tell you that that's probably one of the areas we hear from some agencies or particularly from employees that they don't feel that they're supported through having a SEPM or even allowed to organize as an ERG. Um, that you can rec that Pride Months are recognized with programs like today. You know, Matt talked about, and I'm sure we can all talk about um, I spoke at another agency also this week that that was their first time they're actually doing um, a Pride Month event, okay? And we're talking in 2014, okay? The thing about being able to self-identify, you know, full inclusion is when you don't self-identify because you don't think it's anybody business, anybody's business, not because you're, you're afraid of retaliation, you're afraid of being denied promotion, you're marginalized, okay? When LGBT employees can put the photo of their family on their desk and not hide it when somebody walks in the office, when they can talk about their weekends and use the proper pronoun for the person that they were with on the weekend, and when they can bring their spouses and partners to work, to work events without fear. Here's another one. When transgender employees can use the bathroom freely without agencies having to have hours and hours of meeting on which bathrooms they can use, when employees aren't focused, I have never gotten so many calls about people using bathrooms. And I swear I get these at least once a month, if not every other week. I never knew bathrooms were so popular. And the final one for me is when we don't actually have to have panels that talk about LGBT inclusion. So what are the bright spots? Um, you know, I'm just gonna run through this quickly. So LGBT employees are represented, and, and this is from our EVS. Everybody knows what the EVS is, right? The Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey, and everybody in here is gonna tell me, yes, they filled it out, right? <laughs> when LGBT, LGBT employees are represented in supervisory, management, and executive ranks in the same proportion as the overall federal workforce. So that is one bright spot. Um, we also see that EVS scores for the self-identification for the LGBT is actually um, uh, have a slight uptick. Now, you know that we didn't start collecting that data till FY 2012. So we have 2012 and we have 2013 data. Uh, the period just closed the report out on the 14th, so we should see that data later this year. And yes, the perceptions of those who self-identify as LGBT are slightly less positive 
there are some agencies that show just as positive as their heterosexual colleagues. And let me tell you just a little bit about the DOI number. So government-wide from 2012 to 2013 went from 2.2 to 2.7 percent. So we're seeing, you know, we're hoping that that means employees are getting more comfortable with self-identifying. For the Department of Interior, it actually went from 2.8 to 3.2. So interior, you must have done something that your employees are above the government average in terms of employees um, being able or feeling that they can self-identify. And that is probably, I mean, you're not as high as say like, a, a, um, I believe it's FTC, there's a couple agencies that are like in the five, six, seven percent range. But you know, when the average is 2.2 and 2.7, getting up to the three is pretty good. Considering that statistics generally show about 5% of the population um, identify as LGBT, and it does range from, say, 2% to 15% within that bracket, but a, a good number is generally 5%. When the government employees only not even 3% are, we still have work to do. Um, just one other thing that I want to mention that Last year in September, OPM proposed regulation to include sexual orientation as a non-discriminatory factor in certain employment practices. Hopefully we should get that out soon. I'm not gonna give a time frame, because once we proposed that, you know, it went to all the agencies to comment, it went out for public comment, and then every time we get comments, we have to disposition it and put it back out. So I'm, I'm hoping that it will be soon. So with that, um, again, I'm gonna I think I turn it back to the MC. Um, unfortunately, I think because I have to leave, if I'm not here by the time we get to the panel discussion, anybody feel free to give me a call. I'm at um, Sharon.wong at OPM.gov, or you can use our generic OPM email, which is diversity and inclusion at OPM.gov, and it's just one word. But thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate appreciate all that. Um, I'd like to give uh, Matthew Murphy another opportunity to. If there's anything else you'd like to share with with the panel, with our group, right at the moment. Maybe turn on your. Okay. There you go. Uh, really, just a reiteration of of what I said. I was asked to talk briefly about EEOC updates, and I I actually already talked about them. And the main update is that. Uh, the EEOC has held in a, in a critical decision called Macy that gender identity discrimination is discrimination based on sex. So be very clear, gender identity discrimination is sex discrimination covered by Title VII. Uh, we've also had a couple of cases where uh, uh, claims by LGB, LGB individuals alleging sex stereotyping state a claim of discrimination discrimination based on sex and therefore covered by Title VII. We've also instructed, or our Office of Federal Operations has instructed every EEO office to uh, let individuals who are going through the EEO process, making claims of discrimination based on uh, LGB status, make them aware of the fact that they can proceed under Title VII, uh, 29 CFR 1614, because those claims could ultimately uh, rely uh, or relate to or constitute sex stereotyping uh, discrimination. Our commissioner, uh, Kai Feldblum, her kind of famous quote is, this is her opinion, uh, if gender is on the brain, you got sex discrimination and then you have Title VII. And I talked a little bit earlier about why I think gender is on the brain anytime you have sex discrimination. A couple of other quick points. The EEOC's Office of Federal Operations started a LGBT work group where they brought together representatives from different federal agencies uh, to talk about what's going on at, at their agencies and identify best practices and uh, hopefully a, a report with recommendations will result from that. We also have an employee group. I started EEOC Pride with a couple of others that's thriving. Uh, before that, I created a policy at our agency uh, to have a framework for employee organizations to exist and operate. Uh, the, the Code of Federal Regulations, I don't remember the site, but it provides a, a legal framework for this. And so that's important if there's anybody listening from other agencies or I know you have 
uh, your group here, but if there are people from other parts of the country um, you know, who want to start an organization, there is a framework, and hopefully DOI has a policy that implements that framework. But um, that's pretty much all I have to say right now, but happy to answer any questions later. Great. All right, Matthew, thank you for that. Next, I'm going to break one rule and ask a question for myself, actually. Um, and maybe this could be addressed to Sharon or to Matthew, but I was thinking, Sharon, particularly as you were talking, we talked about the, uh, the FEBS data, and you mentioned uh, you know, statistics on uh, the LGBT federal population. Uh, I mean, I was, when I took the survey myself, I was very surprised and also very happy to see that that demographic information was being collected. Is there, is there any talk about having that, uh, that kind of information collected from all employees? I mean, just as they're onboarding or anything like that? I don't know if any of that, that discussion has ever moved forward or thought about that. heard those those questions have been raised yeah, okay. um, but at this point I don't think any any further movements um, has okay. occurred okay great yeah. right. thanks for that Matthew I, I do think some agencies are working on developing uh, specific surveys for individuals to self-identify um, apart from the EBS I think the Securities and Exchange Commission has has done that and I know others are, are looking at that too That ties somewhat to, um, as Matt says, some agencies. What SEC did was they did a climate assessment survey. And as part of that, they did. NASA also did a DNI as, uh, diversity and inclusion assessment uh, a few years ago. And I believe they just, either probably earlier this year, or the end of last year, also did um, an internal survey. And as part of those surveys, collected that data. But from mm -hmm. a, a broader federal perspective, not at this time. Great. All right. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Okay. We'd like to continue our panel discussion and focus on some employees at the Department of the Interior. Next, I'd like to introduce, uh, introduce Michael or Ike Kelly, as he's good known, as, as well known. Uh, Ike, is a manage Ike is a senior performance analyst in the Department of the Interior's Office of Planning and Performance Management. Ike helps to coordinate policy and guidance for the development of the department's strategic plan, annual performance plans, and performance metrics. Ike specifically coordinates planning and performance related issues with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, and Office of Wildlife Fire, in addition to the Secretary's high priority goal for climate change. <clears throat> Prior to joining the department's planning office in January of, of 2011, Ike spent about 20 years in the field of budgeting, <clears throat> including five and a half years as a budget officer at the U.S. Geological Survey, where he was responsible for all aspects of budget formulation and execution process within the Bureau. In addition to his regular duties, Ike is also one of the department's diversity change agents, which helps to promote, and welcome, promote a welcoming and inclusive workplace for all employees. Ike has been a long-standing member of the LGBT affinity group, the DOI Globe, and has served as its president from 2005 until 2014. So Ike, take it away, Ike. <laughs> Great. Good morning. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, both, both here in the room and, and also on the web. We're, we're thrilled to have you all with us. Um, Sharon and Matthew have just shared some very important information from the OPM and EEOC perspective. Uh, a much broader uh, look at, at, at the overall issue of, of uh, LGBT rights and benefits and, and issues and so forth. Uh, um, but I'd like to talk more specifically about DOI uh, and, and in particular talk about uh, the, from the employee resource group perspective since uh, we have such a, a proactive one here at the department. Um, as I launch into that, I'd, I'd also like to, to come back to our, our theme of the for real positive progress, federal progress. Um, uh, as, as they've noted, I, I've been around for a little while. Uh, I've got about 37 and a half years here with, with the Department of the Interior, and I've seen a heck of a lot of change. Um, and, and in particular, uh, with respect to this uh, issue of LGBT uh, perspectives within the organization. 
I, I can honestly tell you, as, as, a, as a young man of, uh, of the age of 22, coming into the federal government in 1977, I was scared to death. I was so sure that someone would find out that I was gay and that I would, number one, lose my job, because there, you know, even though the Civil Service Commission had ruled that you, you could not specifically fire someone solely on the basis of sexual orientation, that rule really wasn't being very well implemented and it really wasn't very well known and things were happening regardless. You know, um, it, it took a very long time for attitudes to change, for, you know, for perspectives to change in, in, in management certainly and, and then people's minds in general. Um, and, and I came to work every day worried, uh, as Sharon, or as, as Matthew was saying, you know, uh, I didn't want anybody to, to know where I had been, what I had done, where, who I had been with, see me coming from some place that, you know, that might, somebody might have thought was suspect, that sort of thing, that would influence my job. I might not get promoted, I might not get an opportunity, I might not get... Um, the same kinds of benefits and opportunities that my colleagues were getting um, simply because of my sexual orientation. And I was extremely closeted uh, for, for many years until I began to perceive that, that things were improving. Uh, it's amazing to me today to be able to, st my partner's picture sits on my desk. Um, my colleagues and I in the office talk about what we did over the weekend. They're just as concerned about what Mike and I did as I'm concerned about what they're doing and how their families are and how everybody's doing. Uh, and I have no qualms uh, in any conversation or any um, situation in which I'm occurring here uh, to maybe casually bring up the, the mention of my partner if it's appropriate for the conversation. Um, but I have no fears of that. Whereas. 37 years ago, you, I, I, there's no way. I would never have done it. And, and I could not have imagined 37 years ago that I'd be able to sit on a panel and be able to talk about these kinds of issues in front of a, a, a federal group, a large group of people. It just, it just seemed inconceivable. So we've made some huge progress. We've re, you know, things are really remarkably different. And I know Rachel's gonna talk in particular about what some of those causative factors are that, that have led to some of this. So I'm not gonna try to to go into some of those issues, but uh, one, one thing that I'm gonna say, I think really made a strong difference here uh, at Department of the Interior was the Employee Resource Group, DOI Globe. Um, I think we really have made a, a tremendous influence within the, the culture and the work environment at the department, working hand in hand with the Office of Civil Rights. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank all the members of the Office of Civil Rights who are here. Uh, um, Ophelia, thank you very much. But I'm going to mention one who's not here, um, Sharon Eller, uh, our past director. Um, she was the most amazing ally I think we ever had in, in the LGBT community. Uh, she walked hand in hand with us throughout all the, all the activities. She was right there um, on the front lines dealing with every single issue. And she really helped with some creative solutions in terms of how to to try to deal with some some of these issues so i i can never thank her enough for for all the efforts that she achieved but the office as a whole was has just been tremendous to work with if you'll if you'll bear with me i'd, I'd like to digress just a little bit um, to talk about some of the things i think have really made a difference for us here at the department of the interior and i think first and foremost uh, among everything else that GLOBE did, the, the thing that really made a difference right off the bat was that we were able to identify LGBT employees as a demographic substrate of within the employee workforce. I think, you know, Sharon was mentioning, you know, uh, uh, how these groups are, are perceived and noted and so forth. Prior to, to 1993, um, I don't think folks particularly thought of LGBT employees as, as a group, uh, as an organization, as a body of people with collective issues, collective concerns, who might have um, uh, a need uh, that, that needed to be addressed. It was just, you know, there, there was some perception there were just these individuals out there, then that's, that's who they were, and that's, that's how they uh, acted, and so forth. Whereas once GLOBE was able to come in and start talking about this organized construct of LGBT employees as a group and as a, as a demographic, a, a real 
demographic within the employee workforce, it, it really started to make a difference about the way people started thinking about us, the way they started reacting in terms of our questions, our comments, our requests for support, that sort of thing. It, it really turned the corner, I think, in terms of making a difference in terms of how things were, were handled. Uh, we spent a large number of the very earliest years uh, just mostly dealing with um, trying to uh, eradicate some of the vestiges of discrimination. Um, it, it, uh, I don't know if anybody was aware, but it wasn't until 1998 um, that uh, President Clinton signed the executive order banning discrimination within the workforce on the basis of sexual orientation. There had been talk as far back as the Carter administration of doing such a thing and no one had ever done anything about it. And God bless him, I'm so glad he did it, but you know, Clinton didn't even do it until the sixth year of his administration. So, you know, this was a, this was a long time coming. This was something that, that, that had taken uh, quite a while to get there. So our, our early efforts uh, at, at removing some of those discriminatory uh, statements and then and just simply getting sexual orientation included in things like a non-discrimination statement and you know in a, in a job announcement uh, disclaimer you know those kinds of things it it took a number of years of hard work of just going through and constantly you know repeating to people um, hey you know could you please put sexual orientation in your list you know you need to start including that and getting eventually it became commonplace and we could stop focusing on the, on that particular aspect. Uh, but we, we really um, were, were very successful in, in getting a number of significant policy issues uh, submitted, uh, worked, worked through the department. The very first was a set of procedures for the processing of complaints of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Uh, we worked with uh, the, I think it was the EEO office at that time, uh, uh, currently the Office of Civil Rights. And, and got a set of procedures set up. They weren't the same as everybody else's because we weren't covered by Title VII, but they were, they were a reasonable facsimile thereof um, and included a lot of the same steps, but just didn't quite have all the, all the bells and whistles. Um, but we were the first agency here at DOI, or DOI was the first agency to have such a set of procedures. And I think for a very long time afterwards, we were the only agency to have such a set of procedures um, uh, among the federal government. So, uh, we worked with our Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization uh, to get an agreement set up between them and uh, the Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce to promote DOI business opportunities to gay-owned businesses uh, to, as, as a demographic within the small business community uh, to promote the opportunity of, of, of small business uh, partnerships and, and contracts for, for gay-owned businesses. And again, we were the first agency to do uh, such an arrangement and others have, have since followed suit uh, copying DOI's perspective. Um, we spent uh, a number of years recently uh, working on, on getting the the procedures for processing complaints of discrimination upgraded to make them more consistent with what others were doing. And then as Matthew was saying, with the, with the new provisions related to the sex interpretations um, within Title VII, we, we've actually been able to modify our procedures now so that they are almost totally in conformance with the, the same set of procedures as, uh, in terms of other uh, discrimination uh, bases. And uh, we, in fact, now have a new policy that was signed by the secretary herself last year. Um, secretaries don't normally always sign those kinds of things, uh, but Secretary Jewell felt this was incredibly important, and she thought it was something that really needed to be done, and she, she in fact, signed it herself, and that's now part of our uh, departmental uh, manual chapter uh, uh, here at Interior. Uh, just recently, uh, within the last year, we have issued a transgender policy uh, and set of guidelines to assist managers and supervisors in how to support employees in addressing gender identity disorder and, and including especially employees who may be planning a gender reassignment. Uh, these new policies and guidelines were issued April of last year and all, uh, are currently undergoing the necessary technical modifications that would also get them 
incorporated into our departmental the manual chapter uh, uh, as, a, as a permanent policy directive here within the department. Um, we've been, uh, uh, a couple of other sideline things. GLOBE has been effective. Uh, we've worked uh, in, in areas in addition to policy. Uh, we worked with the Office of Communications to create an It Gets Better video. Um, I don't know how many of you may be uh, familiar with that, but the, these are a set of videos that generally uh, a business or an organization puts together um, t whereby the employees of that organization talk about how much their life has improved over time and why things are so much better now, such that young people who may be experiencing discrimination, who are you know, as many of us has said, thought we were the only ones in our family, the only ones in our community, uh, they can get a better understanding and a better feel for, you know, what it's like out there and what they can potentially expect whenever they uh, get out into the real world and, and, you know, have a job opportunity, what, what they can look forward to, a very positive, affirming um, kind of an opportunity. And, uh, the Office of Communications worked with us on that. We got the secretary to participate, Secretary Salazar at that time. Um, so we were very proud to, to, to be able to participate in, in that particular effort. Um, GLOBE was the driver in the, um, uh, the uh, LGBT uh, push to, to get the Stonewall Inn named as a National Historic Landmark back in, in 1999. Uh, we, we were very proactive in the coordination and the communications that, that helped get that taken care of, and we're working today with, uh, with the National Park Service in, in uh, ways that we can, can approach this LGBT theme study that Mary mentioned is, is uh, recently been kicked off, and we're very excited to be able to, to work in that arena. Um, I kind of look at myself as Ancient history, as John said, I've stepped down from, from the presidency this year in 2014. GLOBE is really making some new leaps and bounds and moving forward. If people think that there's nothing left to do, uh, there certainly are plenty of areas of opportunity for, for change and improvement. We have a phenomenal new president, uh, Amelie Koran, who, who is actually with us here today. Um, the, she and her colleagues on our leadership team are are taking GLOBE in new directions. I don't even understand all the technology stuff they're able to, to, to pop out there. I've, uh, they've left me behind, um, but, but I'm thrilled. I'm very excited. Uh, GLOBE, GLOBE is a very uh, proactive organization, so if anybody uh, is interested in the organization, I, I highly recommend you. You can either contact me, contact Amelie. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly get folks uh, set up in there. And, and speaking from the resource perspective, I just want to make sure that, that especially if any LGBT employees are listening and, and are interested in, in getting more information uh, that particularly may help you, um, you know, we have the, the EEOC and the OPM um, capabilities that, that both Sharon and, and, and Matthew have mentioned. But here within the department, you have the opportunities to to work with your Equal Employment Opportunity Office or HR office within your own bureau. Um, you can contact the Office of Civil Rights and you certainly have uh, opportunities with the DOI GLOBE um, Employee Resource Group. If it's individual personal um, issues, things like benefits, uh, complaints, discrimination, employee development, career advancement, that sort of thing about you as an individual, please go to your employee, uh, your bureau uh, EEO office or your HR office to get support on that. That's the, that's the specific organization you should address. Some bureaus have a centralized EEO or HR office. Some bureaus have regional offices um, that are better dispersed to be able to assist employees within the field. You'll have to, to simply check your employee organization to see what that is. I mentioned that you can contact the Office of Civil Rights, but uh, please know the Office of Civil Rights is a policy office for um, equal employment policy and program management within the Department of the Interior. While they may hear your initial inquiry, they're going to direct you into your particular bureau uh, office for processing of your, of your particular issues. And while uh, DOI Globe uh, is, is very proactive, as I mentioned, we cannot get involved in any individual employee um, activity. We are solely um, a forum for communication on 
LGBT issues, uh, for employees to be able to talk to one another, air, air viewpoints, discuss issues, and also serve as a sounding board for working with the department uh, in terms of getting uh, policies and, and issues considered and, and discussed within the department. So if we have issues we want to raise, we can raise them through GROBE. If the department has issues and concerns, um, questions that they want to try to, to understand, they can come to GLOBE and get that kind of information. So I just want to make sure it's important for, for employees to know that you have a number of resource opportunities out there and, and to be able to take care of them. Um, and I think that's probably um, about as much as I have, and I look forward to hearing from, from our other colleagues. So, thank, thank you. Thank you, Ike, and thank you, Sharon, as well. Great. Um, and Ike, thanks for the reminder about DOI, DOI Globe and the resource groups. And I know you recognize Amelie, but Amelie, would you mind just standing up for a moment so folks can, can see this? Amelie Coran as the new president of DOI Globe. Okay, our final uh, panelist before we uh, take questions from, from the audience and hopefully from, from the webcast as well, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Rachel Muir. Rachel is an ecologist currently serving as the science advisor for the Northeast region of the USGS. Her professional experiences include acting director for the Northeast Climate, Climate Center, which is a partnership of university and federal agencies that does research on climate change and how it impacts on natural and cultural resources. Her professional interests have included research on water quality, endangered species, wetland resources, invasive species, and contaminants biology. <clears throat> Ms. Muir has also served in the National Biological Survey, the US, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the U.S. EPA. <clears throat> she has also served as liaison to the, exec to the Executive Office of the President, Office of Science and Technology Policy, on behalf of the USGS, and as technical liaison to the U.S. House of Representatives regarding the Clean Water Act for, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Rachel has also has been a resident of Reston for 30 years. She has, was recently elected to the Reston Board of Directors where she helped craft and employ a policy that is fully inclusive regarding sexual orientation and gender expression. She has two sons, both of which she loves to talk about relentlessly, as she wanted me to make that word, relentlessly. So, uh, Her interests include swimming, biking, and running, and training for Reston's two triathlons and outdoor education. So help. Please welcome Rachel Muir. Thank you, John. The button. Good morning. As you can probably tell, talking about these kind of issues is not my day job. I'm, uh, I'm here for, uh, to learn. As you may have noticed, I was taking notes because there were many things I was learning in this process. It's an honor to be here with these, um, my distinguished panelists. and. I was rehearsing this speech with a friend of mine, and um, I'm a Southern girl. I tend to be rather informal in my speech, and I started to rehearse my speech with a friend of mine, and I began by saying, well, hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming out. And, he said, <laughs> and uh, she, she said, no, 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 go back, go back. That's, that's probably not how you want to start, start your speech. So. How I did start this, though, is I've done some research. I've, uh, like the good scientist that I am, I've spent some time doing some research about the issues that are before us. And I'm going to, here to talk about change. It's not just change within social change and societal change in general. It's about change in this community that we're talking about today. Uh, everyone else has used acronyms. I'm simply going to refer to us as a community, the community. I'll explain that a little bit more later, but I really think of us as a community in a very large and open sense. I got interested in diversity and diversity issues in a variety of ways. One of the things that really sparked my interest was working with, uh, I love to teach. So I spend a lot of time when I can talking about science and particularly to colleges and middle school and high school students, particularly talking to uh, urban schools and whenever I can, trying to encourage young women to consider a career in science. 
that exposure to those, those people and uh, these young people and their enthusiasm got me to thinking about how this community and the young community are changing right now. So when we're talking about change in society, I'm going to talk about change reflected probably most in an exciting fashion and a most uh, vibrant fashion among young people within the LGBT community. And as I go into this talk, you may realize that that term may not serve as well as we think it serves. Okay, I think it's a good time for me to go. I have a short slide presentation and at this point I'm going to find the clicker. There we go. I spent uh, some time in the last few months going to speak to uh, groups of folks associated with uh, youth groups. Um, PFLAG is the organization, it's, it's a complex acronym, but it's basically parents and allies and uh, uh, LGBT uh, young people. And I went, I remember one meeting in particular, I went out to a rural community uh, in Western Virginia, and there were about a dozen young people there. And I was, didn't ask them outright, but it wasn't perfectly clear of which one of those four categories, traditional categories, I suppose, they belong to. And after a little more time, we had about a couple hours, and I came back for a second session. It became clear to me these categories meant nothing to them. They didn't want to associate with being necessarily one or the other. In many cases, they didn't necessarily associate with being straight or gay. There's a great deal of flexibility in regards to young people and how they regard themselves and how they express themselves in terms of their gender and their orientation. What I've got up on the screen right now is a now famous list of terms that Facebook put up for how people can self-identify. Um, I'm not even going to begin to go through that list, but the main point, as you can see, is quite long. In science, when ideas and theories get very complicated, it's usually an indication that the paradigm is breaking down. Usually science is brief and elegant, E equals MC squared. Things are relatively simple. What I think this indicates, that we have such a proliferation of terms to try and describe our community, what I think that means is that we're really beginning to regard not people as categories, not people who fix in a particular box or a, or a particular way to put them in a, some place in a spectrum. It's more about understanding and relating to people as people. Now I've contacted an organization which has done some, I think, some very interesting and wonderful work and I'm going to relate some of this information um, from a project called Self-Evident Truth Project. The individual on this screen is Io Tillett Wright. She's led a very interesting life. She began her young life as an actor, as an actor portraying young men. From the ages of six to 15, she worked in the movie industry and was in movies and TV programs, always portraying a young man. She identified as a young man, having grown up in um, what she described as a very liberal uh, environment in Manhattan and Greenwich Village, where you could pretty much express yourself as you wished. But at 14, when puberty came along and she decided, time to make a decision, she identified as a girl. And eventually, she identified herself as someone who had a preference for men. During all the, the recent turmoil in her young life, which she saw between among the communities and the friends that she knew, she said, maybe the best way to go about trying to demonstrate how much we have in common is to take pictures. She came to the conclusion that exposure is critical, that visibility is essential for people to understand the true range of human experience in regards to gender, 
and sexual orientation. So what I'm going to do now is that she has started a project. And this is a representation of more or less the conclusion, kind of jumps ahead, that this large variety of people are actually all of us. And she found herself having people of all interests, all range of gender and orientation, and many allies joined her in this effort. And that effort was this. She wanted to develop a photographic record of 10,000 individuals who identified themselves as at least 1% gay. 1% gay. And people would volunteer to have their photograph taken. She'd gather some more information about them. Make a long story short, she developed this fabulous set of photographs, which I think speak to the variety of the human experience better than any words I can provide. So I'm going to walk you through some of these photographs. It was quite an extensive effort that she has conducted so far. She's been in 54 cities. She's had over 5,000 different photographs so far. I'm just going to show you a little sampling, probably without comment. I just want you to absorb the images and consider what about the way these people express themselves tells you about who they are. And I'm sorry to have this to your back. I didn't know any other way to do it. OK. Here's our hometown folks. Quite a few of the photographs are from people from this area. Again, these are all people who volunteered. And they allowed this information to be put on the web and made available. You can find it yourself at the website I referenced early and I can provide later. I love these faces. If it, I had the time, I would have shown one picture at a time so you could really focus and look at these young faces and faces of all kinds and see the variety, the diversity. Again, this is a reminder of people who all consider themselves to have some element of gayness about them. I love those smiles. I said there were 54 cities. I focused on our, our local folks, but I'll show a few from other parts of the country as well. Denver. Florida. Io took her photographic journeys to towns large and small. New York City, where she's from, but also small communities in the south, places like Mobile, Alabama, um, Asheville, North Carolina. Not the big cities, not the place for the metrosexuals, but just across the country, everywhere, everybody. Some of these didn't give particular cities, they just said the South. OK. I had an experience when I was doing research for this, which was a bit of an eye opener. We've talked about all the marvelous progress that's been made, and it truly is marvelous progress in a legal sense, in the work that's been done, the advocacy that's been done. But I had a bit of an eye opener when I was doing some research. I saw on the web a reference to this Time Magazine cover. Uh, this uh, woman, many of you may know her, I didn't at the time, Laverne Cox, and she stars in a, in a TV program, Orange is the New Black. It's gotten a lot of critical acc acclaim. And this cover of Time Magazine um, appeared. I couldn't find a copy in the newsstand. Apparently, it flew off the newsstands. I couldn't actually get a hold of a copy, so I tried to look it up online. 
In order to go into Time Magazine and read the article, though, I had to subscribe to it online. I said, well, no, I won't do that. Um, so I went and I read other articles about this cover and about um, the response and the interest of this cover. And I realized that maybe I've been living in a pretty protected environment. When I went out into the web and looked at respectable websites in many respects, and I saw the vitriol that was directed towards this woman, either because she's transgendered or because she's black or because she's both, I was shocked. I was felt physically injured and angry. What that tells me is, is that we've done so much, we've come so far, but there's still a great deal of work for us to do. I said this is, when I started this conversation, I said this is not my day job. Actually, it's all of our day jobs to promote the tolerance and understanding. If we want to have a workplace that's tolerant and accepting for all people, we have to keep these ideas in mind. When we work with the public, that more and more are going to like, look like the photographs that I showed in this, earlier in this presentation, we have to ourselves begin to understand that diversity and accept it, and understand and accept people not in a category, but as individuals, as people. When we reach that point, then maybe we can look back and have a, a true sense of accomplishment to add to what we've done already. What I have up there in uh, the response category is the black box. That's kind of up to us to determine what that kind of response is going to be. One of the great features of the website that I drew these pictures from, when you would go to a particular set of pictures, they're all blanked out. You can't cherry pick. You click on a, a particular part on the screen and a picture comes up. So you can't pick out the people you want. I didn't pick out people who I thought would be particularly well suited for this presentation. I picked them out at random, just like Io had picked them out when she did her photography. Being a scientist, I had to go and look a little more deeply into the physics of what constitutes a rainbow. A rainbow as is white light that passes through a prism, and then all the colors are expressed. I think the take home message here is when you look at a true rainbow, as you find it in nature's, the colors blend one into another. They don't fight with each other, they don't clash. They blend one into another. That diversity within this symbol that we use for the diversity in our community is the same diversity we see in nature. I hope that's the same diversity we'll see and accept in the natural world. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Rachel, very much for that. Um, gave us a lot of, I think, food for thought and uh, helped us to kind of contemplate what this idea of, of change is in our, in our own uh, identity and expression. So I really appreciate that. And I do like the ending of, uh, with, with the rainbow as well. So uh, now's the time in our program. Hopefully everyone's been uh, paying attention, maybe write, jotting down some questions, some thoughts. So we'd like to hear from the audience if you have any questions uh, to any of our panelists. We do have a microphone here, too. We want to make sure that folks on the webcast uh, get to hear your question, so. Great. Any questions? David. Oh, David's helping. Okay. No questions out there? Anyone? Well, let me get, maybe we can get us started off here. Um, I think Sherry kind of addressed some of this, but maybe to uh, any of the panelists. So what can we do in our day-to-day -day work to keep the momentum 
of, of this day going, of pride going, um, to, so, so we can help foster a, a more inclusive environment uh, with, within our workplaces. So I'd like to hear from a panel member want to take that question? What can we do in our daily, daily work life? Rachel, I, go ahead. I, I'll be willing to do that. I, I think, and one thing that I perhaps didn't emphasize enough in my short presentation is that the variety of, of people, the diversity of people we're going to meet in the workplace, and if we're in a manager and we're in the position of hiring, if we're, uh, say, a park ranger or somebody who works with the public, I think that we have to be proactive in trying to understand the, the diversity of that's that's growing daily and how people express themselves and their gender and learn how to respond appropriately that I, I, I don't think you have to memorize that long list that I showed you earlier I think that's a little longer than the roster for the uh, Washington Nationals I'm just guessing but uh, and I couldn't tell you the, the full list and I'm a fan but um, I think uh, spending some time Probably one of the best ways to do that is if you have the opportunity to work across generations. So I found what's been most stimulating in my work and helping to work uh, and encourage diversity in my day-to-day -day job is to go out and teach as a volunteer and to understand what the generations that are coming up behind me are like and their interests and try to show them what sort of opportunities they have in. In, in my case, in science, or whatever interest or, at, uh, interest or uh, vocation that you may have to demonstrate that same interest. And I think you will find it, you will get back three times what you put into it. So those are the brief thoughts on how you might begin to, to keep the momentum going at the workplace. Um, I think one of the things I, I could strongly encourage for everybody is, um, especially as, as Rachel was talking about in, in her presentation, is, the, is this notion of, of categorization. Uh, I, I, it's a natural human tendency. We always want to put a label on something. We want to put it in a box that's similar to other things and so forth. But we, here within the organization, I think we really need to start thinking about each other as individuals and moving away from these concepts of, of things that we think put us in boxes with other people. Um, and so it, as you go about your daily routines, as you go about your, your work as, as a manager, as, you, as you're dealing with people, you're hiring, you, you know, whatever, um, you know, if, if we can stop thinking about um, classifications, categorizations, you know, qualities of things about people that, that we perceive um, might be important, but in fact really are not, uh, to stop, stop, you know, just think about how you go about doing those thought processes as, as you go through those kinds of activities. And just try to start accepting people as an individual. Each person is unique. Each person brings a, a, a phenomenal set of talents and capabilities to the organization. And let's focus on those. Let's, let, let's try to pay attention to, to those qualities and those characteristics and drop away some of these characterization kinds of things that, that we've used historically. Um, take some effort. Um, it's not the way we naturally think, uh, but, it, but you know, you'll, you'll find a, a very rewarding perspective. And you'll find out a, a fascinating awful lot of information about people you had no idea. Mm -hmm. So it's a, 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 a newer way to be, to be thinking about how we, we deal with each other. Okay, see a hand out there, Diane. Yes, I go a long ways back with Ike, and <laughs> um, one of the things that I think we've spent a lot of time doing is we've heard the stories about the fears that people in the LGBT community have, but one of the other things that I think that we have not focused on is the fears that people who are not in the LGBT community, they have with their associations with people in the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. And I think if we continue to move toward our diversity and inclusion policy and treating people as individuals, but there are a lot of fears that people don't realize that people who are not gay, they have 
with being associated with people who are LGBT. And I think maybe one of the next steps might be to concentrate on trying to dispel some of the fears that people outside the community have um, and to bring that group, the two groups together more closely. Yeah, and if, Thank you. if I could comment on that, I, I alluded to that briefly during my opening remarks, but absolutely, I think, um, I think there are a lot of people who are allies and see uh, the, uh, the oppression and repression we face sometimes as LGBTs, uh, and, and for that reason don't want to be perceived as LGBT, and also because they're not. So, you know, want to be true to, to who they are. So one thing we encourage is uh, for allies to self-identify. So we have uh, encouraged marketing campaigns, many organizations have, where you have uh, a, a sticker or a button or something that you could demonstrate, uh, put the world on notice that you are in fact an ally. Uh, and then also within our community, recognizing that somebody may want to be an ally, they may not be perfect, they may not have the full understanding of, of our uh, experiences and may say things that could be sometimes offensive to some people, may not know the full terminology, and that's okay. If you're coming to us with, from a good place, with a good heart, uh, we have to be open to that too and to learning from each other. Uh, I don't know if now is the right time. At some point, I, I would like to I overlook this, highlight some of the accomplishments of FedQ uh, that, that we've actually done. Sure, why don't you go ahead and do that now. Okay, That'd so be I'll be very, very brief. Ike, you know, his litany of all the things uh, a Globe has done, um, DOI Globe really kind of made me uh, think I should talk a little bit about FedQ and what we've done. Before that, I'll mention at the EEOC, we actually borrowed in, in developing our own internal procedures uh, to process complaints of discrimination based on sexual orientation. We did it much after DOI, and we relied heavily on your policy. And we relied very much on, on DOI and DOI Globe and, and many other areas as well. But FedQ, we've been in existence for just over a year, and here are some of the things we've done in that time. Uh, we became the first national LGBT organization, the first LGBT organization, organization admitted into the National Coalition of Equity and Public Service, a very critical, a very powerful, and a very prominent organization that consists of affinity groups such as blacks in government, uh, federally employed women, uh, the Federal Asian Pacific American Council, Society of American Indian Government Employees, um, and federal employees with disabilities. I think I got everyone. But they had been looking for representatives from the LGBT community for many years, and they couldn't find a national organization that uh, was interested or, or willing in participating, or an organization that really functioned as a national LGBT organization. That's one accomplishment uh, that was, um, you know, not without some work and some, conv some convincing. And the board had a vote, and they voted uh, to, to allow us. We provided training. Uh, for the first time at Blacks in Government, I provided LGBT cultural competency training. Never had it before at Blacks in Government. And then I've done that now for four years. Um, and, and that sort of helped build this relationship that helped FedQ get into INSEPS. Uh, we've provided LGBT cultural competency training at other national organizations, uh, conferences, including the Federal Asian Pacific American Council, National Image Inc., a Hispanic serving organization, and Federal Employees with Disabilities all uh, for the first time at these organizations, and we continue to provide it on an annual basis. Uh, we've had several free training events. Um, we had OPM, representatives from OPM, the Acting General Counsel, uh, Sharon and some others come talk about the DOMA decision after that happened. That was a call-in. We had several hundred people call in for that session. Uh, we've started the LGBT Special Emphasis Program Manager Coordination Committee. Uh, it was kicked off recently with a call where we had a couple of hundred people call in from across the country, allowing people to establish a network of, of individuals who do this work or want to do this work, and they're now sharing resources and we're collecting and gathering resources, so people will have one stop to go to. People won't have to reinvent the wheel, and their jobs will be made much easier and much more effective. Um, so I think uh, we also have, we're starting a coordination committee so we can get leaders from different groups we have a lot of groups, uh, DOI, GLOBE is, is one, and there are several other groups that have been incredibly effective throughout the years. 
So we're getting all these groups together and helping coordinate their efforts again so we can learn from other organizations' successes and not put people in a position where they have to reinvent the wheel. We've worked very closely with organizations such as Glyfa uh, in working very hard to get the transgender exclusion removed from federal health benefit plans and uh, continue, although we've made some progress, uh, our, our efforts are not complete. And in this capacity, uh, it's given us a voice. And we have members from just about every agency, including Interior, all across the country. Uh, but our affiliations with these prestigious established groups uh, has, has given us a voice. So we did meet with uh, Catherine, with OPM Director Archuleta. We are in contact with the White House. We do very much want our agenda to be set by our members. And um, so I encourage you all to join and provide us with, with your ideas, your thoughts about what your priorities are. If you have uh, things you can share as best practices, share with us. Transition plans, a couple agencies have done. Uh, we're a far, far away from from having that as being the norm, of course, DOI is at the forefront, as always. Thank you. Thank you. But um, you know, that's the sort of thing we want to we want to make it easier for people. So thanks for allowing me that time to kind of just share some of our accomplishments in the just over a year that we've been in existence. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Um, any other questions from here? Yes. Oh, there's a question back there, Linda. Sorry, first. Hi. Good morning uh, to uh, the distinguished uh, panel members. Uh, truly enjoyed your presentation this morning. But my question is directly, uh, 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 I'm directing my question to Mr. Uh, Matthew, particularly, and anybody else want to join in on a response, I'd appreciate that as well. I was in the military for a few years. Actually, I retired. Now I'm in the federal government, obviously. And there were some terms back then, obviously, were not used. But I was very intrigued with something that you said, Matthew, during your presentation that kind of caught my eye. Quite frankly, I thought some of the terms that you used was rather striking. So I'm curious as to whether or not these were promotional terms, and if I may, terms such as dyke. Uh, you know, I, I would never say that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm curious as do you find those words, do you use those words in, form, in terms of the presentation to make people feel more comfortable as they communicate with the LGBT community? Or I'm just curious as to how you find it so easy to use those words, which from my perspective, I find them to be offensive. And if it is uh, something that we're now doing uh, to make it easier for other individuals to accept the LGBT community, I'd like you to expand on that, please. Sure. Thanks. Um, no, my, my goal isn't to make these terms more acceptable or to make people feel comfortable using them. My goal is to share uh, 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 experiences that I've, I've had and to do so uh, openly. Um, and I, I hope I understood your question correctly. If I didn't at the end, please let me know. Um, but there are terms within every community, of course, that are acceptable within that community. What I do when I'm providing cultural competency training is I'll say, these are terms you can generally assume are OK. These are terms that might, in limited circumstances, be OK for some, but you're, you're better off just not using them if you don't want to offend. So I wouldn't say dyke. I wouldn't say fag. Uh, it, these are things that we're not trying to you know, sometimes marginalized groups co-op terms and try to redefine them. Uh, that's not necessarily a, 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 a something, it's not something we're trying to do. It's certainly not something I'm trying to do. Um, just trying to relate my experiences, uh, you know, kind of accurately and honestly. Does that answer your question? Uh, Thank you for that. Uh, we'll take one more question from here. Uh, Linda in the front. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Green, and I work for the National Park Service. And I've been with the agency for a long time, since 1979. Before that, Matthew, I worked at the EEOC in the Office wow. of General Counsel. Okay. And I worked directly <laughs> for Abner Seibel, who was then the General Counsel. And I reported to the late Judge Julia Cooper Mack, who was my immediate supervisor. The question that I would like to ask, I noticed um, Ike, that you said GLOBE, which is an affinity organization, and you cannot get involved in any uh, personal issues. But my concern in being in the EEO uh, Equal Opportunity Office program for years as a specialist, I worked in special emphasis. In fact, I worked all across the board. And I'm finding out that most 
EO specialists that work from 29, 16, 14 may not really be familiar on how to handle a complaint when it refers to sexual orientation. So I'm thinking, because everybody say I'm a thinker who really know me, I am a <laughs> thinker. I think a whole lot outside the box. Sometimes you gotta come outside the box and go over the ledge. I'm thinking at some point in given time, I really think that the Office of Civil Rights, even along with the bureaus, John, I think we need to have a liaison officer who can serve as a bridge between the Office of Civil Rights and with GLOBE. So when these issues come up, we won't be sitting around the round table how to figure out when it's in the informal counseling stage, how do we handle these complaints? Am I getting across Matthew Murphy, attorney, Esquire? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah, so response. which one wanna take my question? Because yeah. I hear a lot of time people say, well, I'm being bullied or oh, I'm being targeted because of my sexual orientation or um, I'm, I'm given a lot of unnecessary work or impossible, erroneous uh, due dates. So I'm thinking and I'm hearing, okay, how do we handle this? So again, I think that it need to take a closer look, John Burden, and with GLOBE to have somebody who is an expert dealing with sexual orientation complaints. Because most of the times when you come in the EEO, normally it has to do with um, one who's being discriminated against because of their gender or their age or their disability, or either because they didn't get a promotion right. or it's a hostile work environment. Exactly. It, right. So I, I think I'm, that's a great question. and I, I'll provide a, I'm sorry, were you? I'm finished, so, okay. can't, so can't you tell that I work with the lawyers? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. Thank you yeah, very much. <laughs> but uh, real quick, part of the job of the EEO counselor uh, is to help the individual identify the claim. Because when you come, you know, as, a, as an individual, you don't have to know the terminology, you don't have to know, you know, use the right words. That is part of the job of the EEO counselor. In order for the EEO counselor to do that job effectively, they need to know the law, they need to know what help that person. So they need to have both the background, the cultural competency skills, and the knowledge of, of the law as it stands. You don't, it sounds like you don't need it here because you have such an amazing group. One thing FedQ does and has done in many instances is provided free counseling to EEO offices to help them understand, okay, and we develop scenarios where, okay, counselor, this is, you know, somebody comes in, they, they say this. What's your response? And then we use that as a vehicle to help them. It's an ongoing, I run our EEO office. It's, it's ongoing in my own office where I try and I have amazing, amazing people who want to do their job and they want to do it right, but this is new. And so they're still trying to sort it out and I'm still trying to help them have the tools necessary to do their job. You have a great idea and I, I think you could probably speak to that more. No, I know. thank you. I, it, it, it's a great question. I, I know as we were talking about modify, excuse me, modifying the procedures for processing complaints of discrimination, uh, we started talking about the need to have training, that this was going to create a whole new uh, perspective, a whole new uh, way of addressing these particular issues. And, and uh, Ophelia or John or you know, somebody from, from civil rights uh, hopefully can, can tell us where you know, the status of those kinds of things are at this point. But um, I know the Office of Civil Rights started a proactive training approach to educate uh, counselors to make sure that they understood what these uh, guidelines meant, what these new procedures should be. I don't know if we're still doing that or how that's you know, proceeding at this point, but perhaps that's something we need to invest in a little further and um, you know, put, a, put a little more attention to. Um, regarding your, 
uh, suggestion of a liaison officer, um, this is something that Globe has recommended to the Office of Civil Rights for years. Unfortunately, Sharon never had the resources to be able to bring somebody on. I would still advocate for this, um, if I may. Uh, I, uh, it's an area that is, as you mentioned, uh, uh, unknown uh, to a lot of people uh, and an area perhaps that needs a little more extra attention than certain other areas do, and perhaps there's still the merit and the benefit of, a, of such a position um, that, that would assist with this particular type of activity. So I thank you for, for, <laughs> for doing that. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your question, and also to the gentleman who asked the question before, thanks for your service. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to continue, actually. We have uh, the young, young woman at the far right has been waiting very patiently. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Sarah McBride, and, and the, the perspective we're going to hear actually is uh, from someone outside of the federal government who does not work at the Department of the Interior. So I'd like to introduce Sarah McBride. She is a special assistant for the LGBT progress uh, at the Center for American Progress. Uh, at CAP, Sarah's work focuses on issues of workplace fairness and economic and social opportunity for the LGBT community. In her personal time, she serves on the board of directors of Equality Delaware the state's primary LGBT advocacy organization. And in that capacity, she has served as the primary spokesperson for the successful effort to add gender identity and expression to the state's non-discrimination and hate crimes laws back in 2013. <clears throat> Sarah graduated from, the American, from American University in May of 2013. And at AU, she advocated for expanded opportunities for all students as student body president. At the end of her term as student body president, Sarah made national headlines by coming out as transgender in the AU student newspaper. <clears throat> During her senior year of college, she was the first, the first out transgender woman to intern at the White House, where she assisted in the Obama administration's outreach to the LGBT community. For her work, Sarah was named the number one most valuable progressive in Delaware by, Del by DelawareLiberal.net, the state's largest political blog and one of four LGBT leaders under 30, and also in Metro Weekly's 2014 Next Generation Awards issue. I'd like you to welcome Sarah McBride. Well, it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you all to the panelists for uh, great remarks and, and for the questions, they were really wonderful. I know everyone wants their second cup of coffee for the day, so I'll keep my remarks reasonably brief. Um, as was mentioned, I'm one of the roughly one million Americans who identify as transgender. And uh, we've seen a lot of progress in the LGBT community and the uh, push for LGBT rights over the last several years, in large part because uh, so many Americans realize that they know someone who's gay or lesbian. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case for transgender Americans. Only about 10% of Americans uh, say that they know someone who's transgender. So I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about my journey and what brings me here uh, in front of you today. It's always a little surreal to talk uh, about this journey in front of a group of strangers, well-dressed, very attractive group of strangers, um, because for the longest time, the fact that I'm transgender was my deepest and darkest secret. I've known my entire life who I am, but because of a mix of societal prejudices, signals from our media, jokes from friends, and my own aspirations and my own dreams, I kept that inside. And growing up, as I struggled with that, I also developed my professional um, goals. One of those was to work for the government, was to serve my country in some capacity. Uh, and I knew at that time, or at least I thought I knew that I couldn't do that if I lived true to myself. That it seemed to me that my dreams and my identity were mutually exclusive. So I kept it inside. And I went to American University where I was elected student body president. And roughly halfway through my term, as I got to work on issues of equality and fairness for people at American, 
I realized that working on those issues only highlighted my own internal struggle more. So I came out to my parents on Christmas Day in 2011, which uh, I think ruined our Christmas. Um, but I, I came out to my, my friends and my family, uh, the rest of my family, over the next couple days. And then I went back to American and prepared to come out to the student body there. It's not every day that the student body, that president that you elected thinking was a boy, uh, announces that they're in fact a girl. And so I told more friends and I told the rest of, of the student government before I made the announcement. And every time I told someone, I was met with such love and such support. And when I posted an op-ed in the student newspaper saying who I really was and that I was going to live authentically, the entire school exploded with pride. And it wasn't pride in me or excitement for me necessarily. It was an excitement that I felt comfortable doing that at that school. It was an excitement over the fact that the student body was welcoming and inclusive and supportive of students of every kind of background and every kind of identity. And I realized that that's a lucky experience and that's a privileged experience, but it's growing far less unique. And I think one of the exciting things is that the youngest generation, the generation that's graduating from uh, college right now, graduating from high school right now, the generation that's the emerging workforce right now, has moved beyond these conversations about whether LGBT people are people. They've moved beyond the questions of whether we should have pride in LGBT people, and they don't celebrate it once a month, or once a year, rather, they celebrate it all year. I don't know how we have that energy um, to celebrate it all year. It's probably because we're just texting and not doing anything else. Um, but it's a, it's a value that's incredibly important to the emerging workforce. It's a value that's incredibly important, not just for LGBT, Americans, but also for our allies and our friends and our families who are looking to work in places that are truly inclusive of every person. When I graduated from college, um, I was faced with a decision that I don't think anyone should have to make, and it was the decision between going home to the state I love and being safe and secure, because at that time, Delaware was one of 34 states at that point that still allowed for me to be fired for simply being transgender, thrown out of a restaurant simply because I'm transgender. Uh, and at the time, 29 states allowed for an individual who was gay to be fired for those reasons. And so I worked with Equality Delaware, as was, as was mentioned, to help pass those non that non-discrimination bill. And I am incredibly heartened to see that uh, Interior adopted gender identity protections uh, several months ago. But one of the things we know is that this effort uh, for LGBT inclusion isn't just about changing words and documents, it's about changing hearts and minds. And so as much progress as we've made, as, as more Americans can marry than ever before, as we protect LGBT people in more states, as President Obama signs an executive order that expands workplace protections for the single largest amount of LGBT Americans in our history, we know that hearts and minds and the little things still need to change. We need to make sure that our workforce and our office climates are truly inclusive, not just on paper, but in action and in deed. It goes from the small jokes that people make. 60% of gay and lesbian people report hearing jokes about being gay and lesbian on the job. 40% report hearing jokes about people who are transgender. That says to me that I'm not welcome. We also know that there's still a lot of work to be done when it comes to those policies and those um, those documents that have already started to be changed but still need to be addressed some more. For instance, when I was, when I was looking at, at, at where I wanted to settle after graduating from college, one of the thoughts was obviously to stay in D.C., which is what I ended up doing at least for the time being. And when looking in places to, at places to work in D.C., of course, my dream had always been to work for the government. But at that time and still today, although there's been some progress that's been made, my basic health care needs aren't met by the federal government. The insurance for federal employees still denies, for the majority of, of transgender employees, medical care that's been endorsed by every single major medical organization, by doctors and by transgender patients. And so 
when I look at a work, when I work at a, look at a potential place to work, and I see everything from small jokes, and this is across the workforce, to policies that exclude either my basic needs or don't protect me, that's something that tells me that I'm not welcome. And it tells my friends and my family that, they don't, that that organization or that entity doesn't share their values. And so as much progress as we've made, as the, ent as the emerging workforce prepares to enter and graduate from college and enter that workforce, it's time that we do even more to make sure that our documents are as updated as possible, our policies are as updated as possible, that we do the little things, the small day-to-day -day things, to make everyone aware that our federal government is truly inclusive. It's truly welcoming. Another thing I'm incredibly excited about is the new Department of Interior initiative to uh, recognize landmarks that played important roles in the LGBT uh, community's history. And one of the reasons why I'm excited about this is not just because it's gonna educate the American public on, a, on an incredibly important part of our history, but because it's actually gonna save lives. When I grew up, every single thing I saw in the media or in the public said that who I am should be something that I'm ashamed of. But because of something like the, the new initiative at the National Park Service, when I, if I go or if a 14-year-old who is struggling with their gender identity or their sexual orientation, when they go to New York City or when they go to Laramie, Wyoming, and they see a landmark where an important event in LGBT history occurred, and they see that their federal government isn't only recognizing them, but honoring them and their history, regardless of everything else, regardless of all the other noise, they know that the definition of we the people is continuing to expand and that their government loves them. And so that's an incredibly exciting initiative. And I wanna thank you all for being here. I wanna thank you all for listening and being open to learning about new identities, learning about ways to make sure we include everyone in the great work that you're already doing. So with that, I'll end, and thank, again, thank you all very much for coming out today and taking the time to listen. Alex, Alex, can I have you come up here? Come here with the kids. Yes. All right, well, Thank you, everybody. We did, we did have one question on, uh, from the webcast that we're not going to be able to get to, but if we can certainly find out uh, and answer that question, um, if we can find out the identity of the person, but we can work with that later. But thank you, everyone, for your time today, and thank you, audience, as well, for, uh, for participating, for asking your questions, for opening your minds, opening your hearts, hopefully. And um, you know, as we continue our journey, as, as Sarah put it so beautifully, we the people. I really like that part. So um, as a thank you for being part of our panel, we have a small token of our appreciation. And Mary, I'd like you to come up too as well. Yeah, what we have, um, USGS is always famous for presenting uh, benchmarks to, to people. So we do have a uh, benchmark for everyone. Uh, it's part of our Antarctic program. It's one of the benchmarks that was used back in 2004. So it's, uh, uh, we, we hope you enjoy it. And, and thank you very much again for helping us. Well, thank you, folks, and um, enjoy the rest of the day. One more reminder, uh, just for folks on the webcast, again, if you'd like to earn credit for uh, today's um, uh, presentation, make sure you send an email to Barbara Rogers. That's B-R-O-G-E-R-S at USGS.gov. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of your day. Stay cool.